Good morning, everybody. I'm Kathy Goldstein. I'm an associate professor of neurology at the University of Michigan Sleep Disorders Center. And this morning, we're going to be talking about circadian neurobiology. Lots of content to go over today. And I do have some cases at the end that we may not make it to. I'll keep an eye on time. But if we don't make it to those cases, I am told that all of these slides will be available at the AASM website. So you guys can access those. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. You can ask questions during this presentation just by clicking this Q&A icon that you should see on your screen. And again, this is being recorded and posted to the AASM website, so you can review this at any point after it's up, about one to two weeks after today. Okay, so before we get into circadian rhythms, I just want to review a little bit about the neurobiology of sleep. So there's a two-process model that controls our sleep, and it's comprised of the homeostatic sleep drive, which can be thought of as the hourglass, and the circadian rhythm, or the clock. So starting with the homeostatic sleep drive, this is also referred to as process F, and can be thought of as sleep hunger, because this increases with accumulated wakefulness and then dissipates by sleeping. The electrophysiological manifestation of this is delta, or slow wave, power in non-REM sleep, and that decays rapidly after the first few hours of sleep. The homeostatic sleep drive is mediated by somnogens. The one that we know the most about is adenosine, and adenosine accumulates with prolonged wakefulness as cells become fatigued and they can't phosphorylate adenosine into ATP. Why do I have this Starbucks cup here? Because we know that caffeine is an adenosine receptor antagonist, and that's likely how caffeine mediates its alerting effects. So somnogens inhibit wake-promoting neurons, and they disinhibit activity of the preoptic area, and that's how they result in the generation of sleep. Now, how would we sleep if we just had the homeostatic sleep drive? We would sleep in multiple bouts dispersed through a 24-hour day. They'd be about two to three hours in duration. And then once we built up that homeostatic sleep drive again, we'd go back to sleep, dissipate it, and then be up again. And as you can imagine, that's not a very adaptive way of living. And that's why we have the circadian timing system. Circadian is Latin for about a day. This is also known as process C. And circadian rhythms are any endogenous physiological process that repeats on the order of approximately 24 hours. And the likely reason that we have circadian rhythms is so that organisms can both anticipate and optimally react in reaction to light-dark changes that are due to the Earth's rotation on its axis every 24 hours. The real key to understanding circadian rhythms is to understand that these are truly inherent, self-sustained oscillations. So these persist in the absence of time cues, in the absence of light-dark changes. So these are circadian and not diurnal. Looking at the history, circadian rhythms, our understanding goes back to the 1700s when the astronomer De Moran observed the mimosa pedica plant to open its leaves during the daytime and then close them at night. And he wanted to know if this was just a reaction to light-dark changes. So he isolated the plant in darkness and the opening and closing of the leaves persisted, showing that the mimosa pudica plant leaf opening and closure was indeed inherent to the plant as a post-reaction to light and dark. So the human circadian clock, our central clock, ticks or has a circadian tau just over 24 hours, on average 24.18 hours. And how do we know this? We know this from research studies where individuals were isolated from light, dark, and other time cues, and additionally underwent a forced desynchrony protocol to isolate circadian rhythmicity from influences of sleep and wake. And in that context, 
processes that were wholly controlled by the circadian rhythm, such as the secretion of melatonin and cortisol and the rhythm of core body temperature, were measured. And the peak to peak and trough to trough of these cycles was on average 24.2 hours. Now, how do we maintain the self-sustained oscillation, the ticking of the clock? This is based on a transcriptional, translational, negative feedback loop. And I'm just gonna hover my mouse here. So this blue and green here, these are female and clock proteins. These form heterodimers in the nucleus, and they bind to the EBOX promoter of PER and CRI. So BMAL and CLOCK promote the transcription of PER and CRI, which are translated and then form heterodimers in the cytoplasm, translocate back into the nucleus, and inhibit their own transcription. And this cycle takes place, as you can imagine, on the order of about 24.2 hours, and what fine tunes the feedback loop is post-translational modifications that change the degradation rate of the per and cry proteins, and also ancillary loops such as Ruhr alpha and Rev herb. So how does this look if we think about an individual with a normal circadian clock that's entrained appropriately to a 24-hour day? So BMAL here is represented by Arntel. So BMAL and clock heterodimers, again, form in the nucleus, and they promote the transcription of PER and CRI starting at the beginning of the daylight period. And then by the end of the daylight period, PER and CRI have started to build up in the nucleus and therefore inhibit their own transcription. Over the course of the night, those PER and CRI heterodimers are degraded and depleted and therefore, at the beginning of the next day, PER and CRI are transcribed again, forming that 24.2-hour loop. Okay, so we talked about the regulation of sleep being a two-process model. So how does that model work? On the bottom here, you can see a clock starting at 9 a.m., ending at 9 a.m. the next day. On the top of this picture, we have the sleep load or the homeostatic sleep drive. The longer the arrow, the greater the homeostatic sleep drive. On the bottom, we have the circadian alerting system. And the same, the longer the arrow, the more robust that circadian alerting signal is. So let's start at the beginning of the day at 9 a.m. upon an individual waking up from sleep. So this 9 a.m. wake time, this is clearly not a sleep fellow. But we can see upon awakening, the homeostatic sleep drive is very low. And then it grows throughout the day. So how do we maintain wakefulness until bedtime? That is because in opposition to the homeostatic sleep drive, the circadian alerting system grows and grows and grows. And that circadian alerting signal peaks around 9 p.m. in a normally entrained individual just before melatonin secretion. And at that time, the circadian alerting system has a precipitous drop in the alerting signal. And that drop, combined with an already high homeostatic sleep drive, facilitates sleep onset. So how does somebody maintain sleep after this homeostatic sleep drive is rapidly dissipated? That's because the circadian alerting system the signal remains low, and the circadian alerting signal reaches its absolute nadir about two to three hours prior to habitual wakefulness. Now, I want to draw your attention to two different points in alertness in this figure. So we have a dip here in the afternoon. This is called the circadian dip, but it should really be called the two-process model dip, in my opinion. And this is a point in the day where there's some drowsiness because the homeostatic sleep drive is high, but the circadian alerting signal has not mounted enough to completely oppose it. Additionally, we see a peak in alerting signal just before the alerting signal drops, just before that secretion of melatonin begins, and we call this the forbidden zone for sleep because the circadian alerting signal has overshot the homeostatic sleep drive. 
When the hemiostatic sleep drive and the circadian alerting signal are working appropriately and someone is not sleep deprived, this results in a 16 hours of consolidated wakefulness and eight hours of sleep. Now, in clinical practice, we do not typically measure objective circadian phase, which could be marked by melatonin secretion or the rhythm of core body temperature. However, based on what we know about the relationship between circadian phase and habitual sleep, we can estimate these markers. Now, this gray period here is the habitual sleep period. That doesn't mean when you want to sleep and want to wake up. That means when your body would naturally prefer to sleep. For an adolescent, for example, weekends, vacations would be a great way to determine this. And in this picture, we have our clock on the bottom. As I noted before, we have this gray habitual sleep period. And this dotted curve here is the secretion of melatonin. So dim light melatonin onset, which is the takeoff of melatonin secretion, is going to occur roughly two hours prior to the onset of habitual sleep. This is called dim light melatonin onset because it has to be measured in dim light as light suppresses melatonin secretion. We can see the melatonin increases and then peaks during the second half of the sleep period. And then our core body temperature is a solid line here and the nadir of that core body temperature, which aligns with the nadir of the circadian alerting signal, is roughly two to three hours prior to habitual sleep offset. And again, not when your alarm goes off, but when your body would naturally wake up. And that's how we estimate people's objective circadian phase. So moving to the anatomy and physiology of these properties, this may be in a review for you guys. Let's talk about the history about what we know of sleep and wake. So roughly 100 years ago, there was an epidemic of encephalitis lethargica and von Economo autopsied many of these patients and found that when people had encephalitis that involves primarily the posterior hypothalamus and midbrain, they were incredibly sleepy. So the posterior hypothalamus and midbrain were thought to be wake-promoting regions of the brain. However, when there were lesions of the preoptic area and rostral hypothalamus, severe insomnia ensued. So those areas were thought to be sleep promoting. In the 1940s, after stimulation of the reticular formation in the brainstem of anesthetized animals showed a shift in the EEG to wakefulness, the reticular activating system was dubbed as the arousal promoting center of the brain. So what do we know now? So in regards to the anatomy and physiology of wakefulness, we know that wakefulness cannot be localized to the reticular activating system alone. There are various neurotransmitters and anatomic locations that promote arousal. So starting with the monoaminergic cell groups, these cell groups have wide projections to the cortex and throughout the brain. The locus ceruleus is our main source of norepinephrine for wakefulness. The dorsal and median raphe are our main cell groups that transmit with serotonin. Dopamine is primarily from the ventral tegmental area when we're looking at wake-promoting properties. And the tuberomammillary nucleus are where our histamine-producing cells take place. The basal forebrain is also involved with the promotion of wakefulness via GABA transmission, which is going to decrease the activity of cortical inhibitor, inhibitory interneurons, but the basal forebrain also uses acetylcholine and glutamate to promote wakefulness. The pedunculopontine and lateral dorsal tegmental nuclei, as well as the parabrachial nucleus, are also wake-promoting centers. And the erection cell groups of the lateral hypothalamus are required for the stabilization of long periods of wakefulness and, as you know, are also involved with stabilizing stage R sleep to ensure that stage R sleep does not intrude into inappropriate points of the sleep period or wakefulness. We see this manifested clinically in narcolepsy with erection deficiency where people cannot sustain wakefulness, they cannot sustain sleep either, and they have REM intrusion at inappropriate times. 
In addition to the lateral hypothalamus containing erectin cell groups, both the lateral and posterior hypothalamus also use GABA cell groups to promote wake by inhibiting the sleep-promoting regions. And this results in kind of this mutual inhibition or flip-flop switch of sleep and wake. Moving on to sleep, we know that non-REM sleep generation takes place primarily in the preoptic area, the ventrolateral preoptic area through GABA transmission, and the median preoptic area through GABA and galamine transmission. So not only do these actively promote sleep, but again, they inhibit wake, the basal forebrain, parafacial zone, and cortical nitric oxide synthase neurons also are active during non-REM sleep, so we're learning more and more about other areas of the brain that promote non-REM sleep, but primarily this localizes to the preoptic area. What about the anatomy and physiology of stage R? So this is now known to be controlled by a relationship between REM on and REM off nuclei. The REM on nuclei are the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus, the sublateral dorsal nucleus, and the pre-ceruleus region. When these are active through glutamatergic transmission, there is muscle atonia, and you can see here, so this is the REM on group here, and there's glutamatergic transmission to the ventral medulla, as well as to the spinal horn, which communicates with motor neurons, and this produces the REM atonia. Additionally, the REM on center communicates with the cortex and the hippocampus to produce the activity that we're used to seeing on REM EEG and dreaming. Again, we have this mutually inhibitory flip-flop switch where in addition to producing those characteristics of stage R sleep, the REM on, cent on centers also inhibit the REM off centers, and that's the GABAergic transmission. And these areas that are listed in gray here, I won't go over these, but these modify the REM on centers. REM off is achieved by the ventrolateral periactal aqueductal gray and the lateral pontine tegmentum. When these areas are active, they inhibit REM on through GABAergic transmission. And these are assisted by erectin cells, locus ceruleus, and the dorsal rapid. So, how does this come together in the brain? How do we determine when the arousal, the wake-promoting pathways, are taking place versus when sleep pathways are activated? So that is the manifestation of the interaction between process S and process C in the brain. So with sustained wakefulness, we have accumulation of somnogen, that homeostatic sleep drive. We discussed adenosine, but also cytokines, prostaglandin D2, and this mediates process S. However, this process is also controlled by input from the circadian clock or process C, and our central clock is located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus right here behind the optic chiasm. And this is a paired nuclei, as you can see in this picture. The SCN is comprised of a shell and a core, and it's thought that the coupling between the two is vital for the self-sustained 24.2 oscillation of the central circadian rhythms. The core of the SCN, however, is the primary center for integration of entrainment signals. For example, primarily light, which goes through the retinohypothalamic tract and is transmitted to the core by glutamate, and pituitary adenocyclate transmission, as you can see here. Okay, so what is the output from the SCN that controls whether we're in sleep versus wake? So the SCN sends its primary afferents that control sleep and wake to the subparaventricular zone and the dorsomedial hypothalamus. In turn, the dorsomedial hypothalamus communicates with activating signals to orexin neurons and the other arousal centers and through GABAergic transmission to the ventrolateral preoptic nuclei, our sleep-generating nucleus. So how does this look during the daytime? 
when the circadian alerting signal is high. So we have second order neurons going to the dorsal medial hypothalamus, exciting the erexin centers, and then also increasing transmission in the arousal system to baromammillary nucleus, locus ceruleus, and dorsal raphe, so histamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, respectively. So in addition to promoting wake when these are active, they also inhibit the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus. When the SEN is active, we also have dorsomedial hypothalamic transmission via GABA to inhibit the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus and therefore disinhibiting the arousal system, again representing this mutually inhibitory flip-flop switch. What happens during sleep? We don't have activation of our arousal centers and therefore inhibition on the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus is now released. We also don't have that GABAergic transmission. So the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus is free to promote sleep and also inhibit the arousal centers. Now, our central clock in the SEN controls more than sleep and wake. It controls other behaviors like feeding, core body temperature, hormone secretion like melatonin and cortisol, and autonomic function. Also, in addition to having this clock in the SCS, we have peripheral clock machinery throughout the bodies in the cells of all of our organs. And that's very relevant because not only can our sleep and wake and our behaviors be misaligned with the light-dark cycle, but our SEN can be misaligned with our behaviors our central clock can be misaligned with our peripheral clock. We can also have desynchrony between the different clocks within our organs and within a single organ itself. So as you can imagine, circadian disruption may be the manifestation of many diseases, and circadian disruption is likely to influence many negative health conditions as well because of this very carefully coordinated system that the SCN is the conductor of. Okay, so we talked about how our clock ticks via this transcription translational feedback loop with a period of 24.2 hours. Now, the external day is 24 hours, not 24.2 hours. So how do we entrain our endogenous clock to the external day? And that's by circadian time givers or what we call zeitgebers. And the strongest zeitgeber is light. And light is received through the eyes via the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. These are distinct from rods and cones. These contain melanopsin, and the peak central sensitivity of melanopsin is 480 nanometers, which matches the circadian responses that are most sensitive to short wavelength light. Now, not only the spectrum of light, but also the duration and intensity can impact the magnitude of phase shift and direct melatonin secretion, but these are not linear properties. You can see from the figure here that the retinohypothalamic tract relays that light information from the IPRGCs to the SCN, again, via glutamate transmission, and then this is then relayed via postganglionic fibers through the superior cervical ganglion to the pineal gland. Now, the way light entrains our endogenous circadian rhythm is entirely dependent on the biological time in which the light exposure takes place, in addition to things like spectrum and duration and intensity. So, looking at the x-axis of this graph here, and this is something that's called a phase response curve to light, or the PRC to light, we can see habitual sleep time, and again, habitual sleep time, not when you want to sleep, not when your alarm goes off, but when you would naturally sleep, is denoted here. The positive numbers are hours after habitual sleep time, and the negative numbers are hours before habitual sleep time. On the y-axis, we have the amount of phase shift that's produced by the stimuli, and the stimuli here is 8,000 lux of broad-spectrum light for one hour. Oops, sorry. 
Negative numbers denote that the endogenous clock is being moved to a later time or a phase delay in reference to external time, whereas positive numbers denote a phase advance the endogenous clock is being moved earlier in reference to external time. So what we can see here is that starting about three hours prior to habitual sleep onset and going through about two to three hours prior to habitual sleep offset, that light produces a phase delay. And that phase delay is greatest right here, right around the beginning of habitual sleep time after melatonin secretion has already begun. This is highly relevant because what do we all like to do right here? We like to take our mini suns, our iPads, our iPhones, Androids, laptops, and shine them in our face. And so we could definitely be producing a phase delay based on the PRC to light at this time. This crossover point where light goes from producing a phase delay to a phase advance coincides with the core body temperature in a year, and you can see that after this time, light exposure will result in a phase advance, and this goes on throughout the day, but we think about this being most important during the first few hours after habitual wakefulness. So how does this resonate with our usage of technology? Given that portable technologies have LED backlit screens. We now have the ability to bring blue light into the bedroom and at a time where it can have a negative effect on our circadian timing and our sleep. So there was a great study in which an e-reader that was set at low luminosity, so 30 to 50 lux for four hours, was used before bed compared to a paper book and room light and use of the e-reader resulted in direct melatonin suppression, as you can see from panel A and B here. This is the e-book. We can see there's decreased melatonin secretion while it's being used, and this is the percentage of melatonin secretion, and we do see that's higher with the e-book as compared to the paper book. And in addition to that direct melatonin suppression, use of the e-reader also resulted in a circadian phase delay so the secretion of melatonin became later, the start of it was later, and the peak of it was later, and phase delays up to one to two hours were observed with use of the ebook. This collectively resulted in decreased evening sleepiness, so more alert when you want to go to bed, sleep latency was increased, and morning sleepiness was also increased. Gaming on a smartphone for two and a half hours has demonstrated association with a delay in melatonin onset, as well as use of a computer for two hours, which has been related to melatonin suppression. Now, these are very well-designed studies, so we do have to keep in mind that these effects um, in the home environment are not as simple. They might be dependent on prior light exposure, Duration of use of the device, as you can see, reading with an e-reader for four hours is a pretty extensive amount of time, and then other patient-specific intrinsic factors regarding circadian phase. Now, many of you may have um, seen some media coverage of this paper. This was a paper that just came out in Current Biology called Cone Support Alignment to an Inconsistent World by Suppressing Mouse Circadian Responses to the Blue Colors Associated with Twilight. So this was a basic science study on mice looking at low levels of blue colored light. Now, this study was well done, and the study was described completely accurately by the authors, but this study got very um, blown up in the media to maybe mean things that it did not. Like, for example, forget about what you think you know about blue light and sleep and showing this individual with a phone that looks like it's on its brightest luminance in the sleep period. So this study was looking at the cone contribution to circadian phase shifts. This study does not debunk the well-known fact that the melanopsin within the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells has a peak sensitivity of 480 nanometers, 
So that short wavelength blue-green light. And this study absolutely does not prove that LED backlit electronics when used around the sleep period are not sleep disrupting. The goal of the study, as I had mentioned, was to evaluate cone-based chromatic signals, so not the IPRGC transmission to the SCN. And the investigators did this by providing identical melanopsin activation and isolated the activation of the cones alone. And what they found was that blue appearing, so blue chromatic stimuli, reliably produced weaker circadian behavioral responses than yellow. And I'll just read this. That means that naturalistic color changes support circadian alignment, again, naturalistic, when environmental conditions render diurnal variations in light intensity that are weak or ambiguous sources of timing information. So low levels of light, low blue light at twilight, and low warm spectrum light at dusk. Twilight is not equivalent to using a laptop in bed. So this study was incredibly valuable to help us understand the cone contribution to circadian entrainment, but it does not debunk what is already known. And light from blue lit, blue backlit electronics definitely can phase delay and suppress melatonin. Okay, so we talked about how light can entrain circadian rhythm. Melatonin is a non-photic site gaber to the central clock. Other things like feeding, exercise are also relevant, so we think about melatonin because we can get this exogenously. So melatonin output that's endogenous from the pineal gland is controlled by the SCN, but also feeds back on the SCN as an input to the clock. As we briefly discussed, melatonin is secreted by the pineal gland under the regulation of the SCN via transmission through the superior cervical ganglia and those postganglionic fibers, as you can see from this figure here. There's multiple different melatonin receptors throughout the body. Melatonin receptors one are thought to inhibit SCN fires, while well MT2 receptors are thought to be more so the ones that mediate phase shifts. And again, melatonin secretion can be affected not only by phase and by shifting phase, but melatonin secretion is directly suppressed by light exposure as well. So just as we have a phase response curve to light, we also have a phase response curve to exogenous melatonin. And the stimuli here is 0.5 milligrams of melatonin. Again, our habitual sleep time when we would naturally sleep is located here. Positive numbers are after habitual sleep onset. Negative numbers are hours before habitual sleep onset. On the y-axis, we have negative numbers denoting that the stimuli produces a phase delay or moving endogenous circadian phase later in reference to external time, while the positive numbers demonstrate a phase advance, and that means moving endogenous phase earlier in reference to external time. So when melatonin is dosed a few hours prior to habitual sleep onset, so at least two hours, and a peak response at more five to six hours, we see a phase advance. When melatonin is dosed within two hours before habitual sleep onset and throughout the night and the first few hours after sleep, melatonin can produce a phase delay. And this is why we're very careful with the timing of our melatonin, because if you're taking melatonin right here at the beginning of the habitual sleep period, that is gonna produce a phase delay as opposed to a phase advance. Okay, so sleep occurs with its best quality and optimal duration when sleep takes place, when the circadian timing system is promoting sleep and not alertness. And circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders result when somebody is attempting sleep during a time when the endogenous circadian phase is not attempting sleep, or somebody has an inability to entrain circadian phase, or 
somebody has a normally functioning central clock and is able to entrain, however, there's external circumstances, external light, dark situations that are superimposed on them that misalign their sleep-wake time with endogenous circadian phase. Now, to have a circadian sleep-wake rhythm disorder, the disruption has to lead to insomnia or excessive sleepiness. So what that means is just because you're a night owl does not mean you'll have delayed sleep-wake phase disorder. And just because you're somebody that works shifts doesn't mean you're going to have shift work disorder. So there are six well-described circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders, delayed, advanced, and irregular sleep-wake rhythm disorder, as well as non-24-hour sleep-wake rhythm disorder, are thought to be the intrinsic circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders due to a problem with the central clock and or its ability to entrain to a 24-hour day, as opposed to shift work and jet lag disorder when abnormal light, dark, and desired sleep-wake schedules are superimposed on a normally functioning central clock. Okay, so we've made it to our cases on time. So case one, a 17-year-old male notes difficulty falling asleep at night for the past three years. Currently, he gets into bed at 11 p.m., but he tosses and turns for hours. He will snooze his 8 a.m. alarm. He's missing his 9 a.m. class. On the days he does make it to his 9 a.m. class, he gnaws off unintentionally. He will often nap during these afternoons. He gets a second wind around 9 p.m. and is very productive at night. Even if he makes it to his class and avoids napping, he still can't fall asleep when he likes. He can't wait until summer break if he feels great and has no trouble sleeping when he can stay up until 2 a.m. and sleep in until 11. You obtained actigraphy on this patient, and you can see there is a decrease in activity around 2 a.m., 3 a.m.-ish sometimes, as early as 1. Oftentimes, there's an offset in this estimated sleep period as late as noon, but sometimes earlier. We don't know what kind of external constraints were here. And just a word about actigraphy. Actigraphy uses a wrist-worn accelerometer to estimate sleep based on the premise that you move more when you're awake than when you're asleep. So each one of these lines here represents a minute of activity. And the higher the line, the more at the activity. And all of this data is downloaded and then a software package analyzes it with a weighted sum algorithm, at least with Respironics, that's what's used. And that is used to estimate sleep versus wake. And this has been highly validated against PSG. So this was revealing in this patient. And it appears that he has delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, which is when someone is late endogenous timing and when they try to sleep at conventional times. This results in insomnia, sleep onset, and then morning sleepiness if they're trying to get up before they're biologically ready, because sleep onset tends to be around 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. in these individuals and offset around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so if the gray here is the desired sleep period, we can see that delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, the propensity for sleep occurs later than the desired time. Pathophysiology of delayed sleep-wake phase disorder. There's been circadian mutations that have been, circadian clock gene mutations that have been identified, such as in CRY1. PER3 might be implicated, although it's unclear if that just is related to chronotype preferences versus actual development of delayed sleep-wake phase disorder. It's also been considered that these individuals have a prolonged circadian tau. They're more sensitive to the phase delaying effects of light and vice versa, less sensitive to the phase advancing effects of light. They receive increased exposure to light in the phase delay portion of that PRC to light that I showed you, so producing a perpetual phase delay. And they're less exposure to light in the phase advanced portion. Additionally, these individuals might also have a problem with their homeostatic regulation of sleep and how the two process model interacts. So in this picture here, this is a study of individuals. The black bars are people with delayed sleep phase and the clear bars are controls. And they were sleep deprived for 24 hours and they were given ultra short 10 minute sleep opportunities. And then the minutes of sleep in that opportunity were assessed. And what you can see 
is after sleep deprivation, the patients with delayed sleep-wake phase disorder slept less than controls during those 10-minute nap opportunities, and that that discrepancy is most pronounced during the period of time where melatonin is not being secreted. So this gray period here is where these individuals were secreting their own melatonin. So people with delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, in addition to having late endogenous circadian phase, even when you look apart from that, they might have difficulty regulating the homeostatic sleep drive as well. But this remains to be seen. So which of the following treatment regimens would you start on this patient? A, we gave modafinil 100 milligrams every morning for excessive daytime sleepiness. B, Zolpidem at bedtime and CBTI. C, melatonin and light therapy with melatonin 3 milligrams at 2 a.m. and light therapy beginning at 6 a.m. with 2,500 lux for two hours. Or D, melatonin and light therapy as follows, melatonin 1 milligram at 8 and bright light therapy for an hour upon awakening. I know this is pretty unnatural because I am talking to you guys through a screen and we're not together. <laughs> so I'll give you a moment to think about these different choices. Okay, everybody have their answer. The correct answer is D and I'll show you why. So let's remember our phase response curve. So the core body temperature minimum is here, about two to three hours prior to habitual, natural sleep offset, and light before that time is going to produce a phase delay. Light after that time will produce a phase advance. We also have our phase response curve to exogenous melatonin. Taking exogenous melatonin a few hours with a peak around five hours or so before habitual sleep onset is going to produce a phase advance. So this is a clock here. If we have an individual who sleeps well from about 2 a.m. to 11 a.m., but they want to sleep at an earlier time, we're going to estimate their core body temperature minimum around 9 a.m. Their dim light melatonin onset is estimated around midnight. So if this person gets light after the core body temperature minimum, so after 9 a.m. and the first few hours after awakening, that will result in an advance. If they take melatonin at 8 p.m., which is going to be about four hours prior to DILMA, six hours prior to habitual sleep onset, that will also produce a phase advance. And what this does is it moves the habitual natural sleep time earlier into the desired window for sleep. Case two, a 72 year old male comes to your clinic for evening sleepiness and inability to remain asleep throughout the early morning hours since moving in with his son's family six months ago and trying to stay on their schedule. When living on his own, he had no problems with sleep. Do you obtain actigraphy? What do the history and actigraphy suggest? Okay, again, actigraphy is based on the premise that we move less when we're asleep. So we can see that sleep onset here is around 1900, even as early as 1800 here. And this patient is starting to move around around 4 a.m. So this is advanced sleep-wake phase disorder where individuals have early endogenous timing and if they try to go to sleep and wake at conventional times, they're going to be sleepy in the evening prior to the desired bedtime, and they're not going to remain asleep until they want to wake up, so they'll have insomnia at the end of the night. And if this gray bar here is when people want to sleep, what they consider conventional, individuals with advanced sleep-wake phase disorder are going to have habitual sleep periods that are timed earlier than that. Now, we see advanced sleep-wake phase disorder as individuals age, but in those who have this and they're younger and there's a family history, we know that there are genes that are transmitted with an autosomal, autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, as you can see from the pedigree on the right, and some of those identified mutations have been in PER2, casein kinase delta, and CRY2, all core components of the clock. 
these individuals may have a shortened circadian tau. So what that means is they can entrain to the 24-hour day, but it's at a time earlier than they would like. They may also have more sensitivity to the phase advancing effects of light and less sensitivity to the phase delaying effects, which result in their endogenous timing remaining earlier. And they might have increased exposure to light in the phase advanced portion of the PRC and vice versa as well that perpetuate the disorder. So what time is the estimated dim light melatonin onset and when should light therapy begin in this patient? Again, I'll give you a few moments to think about what your answer should be. Okay, so we can see that sleep onset is typically between 1900 and 2000 to 7 and 8 p.m. So that means estimated dim light melatonin onset would be between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. if we're assuming those estimated normal phase relationships between circadian phase and habitual sleep-wake. So just as the sleep-wake period is advanced, it advanced sleep-wake phase disorder, so is objective circadian phase. So we know that dim light melatonin onset is going to be around 5 p.m. or two hours roughly prior to habitual sleep onset. So therefore, when we're looking at light, we know we want to produce a phase delay in somebody with advanced sleep-wake phase disorder to align them to their desired sleep-wake time. And that phase delay can be produced by light therapy that begins about four hours prior to the habitual sleep period here. So giving this patient light anywhere between 1600 and 1 a.m. is going to produce a phase delay. Case three, a 78-year-old man with Alzheimer's dementia is brought to the sleep clinic by his 24-hour per day caregiver. She notes he's very sleepy during the day and often finds him sleeping in a recliner for two hours a time, multiple times per day. Despite this degree of tiredness, he seems to have difficulty staying asleep at night and he's often up in the middle of the night watching TV. The caregiver has enforced strict habits to improve sleep hygiene, but nonetheless, he still has a sleep pattern. This is suggestive of a regular sleep-wake rhythm disorder, which is very nicely depicted here. So this is an irregularly irregular sleep-wake pattern with an apparent absence of a circadian rhythm of sleep and wake. To diagnose this, there must be at least three sleep episodes per day. This is seen in dementia and children with developmental disorders, and this is thought to be impairment of function of the circadian clock or perhaps restricted access to Zeitgebers, for example, in a very demented patient that's in an institutionalized environment. Case four, the sleep diaries of a 36-year-old male with intermittent insomnia and excessive daytime sleepiness are plotted below. What do the filled and empty circles most likely represent? Give you guys a second, take a look at this. Okay, so first of all, what do we think this individual has? So this is likely non-24 hour sleep-wake rhythm disorder because we see a progressive delay in the sleep-wake time day to day. And I just wanna show you guys a picture. So we typically depict circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders um, in kind of this linear fashion um, with the clock on the x-axis. Now, the interesting thing about non-24-hour sleep-wake rhythm disorder is you can think of the symptoms of this disorder resulting from a desynchrony and oscillation. Um, so I had a PhD I work with make this picture. And the blue dash line is a 24-hour oscillation, and the red dash line is a 25-hour oscillation. And what this shows is that if there's no entraining mechanism, if there's no stimuli to bring that red oscillation back to the 24-hour day, you see these come in and out of line with each other. And that's why we see differences in the sleep-wake symptoms in this disorder dependent on how circadian phase falls in reference to external time. 
think of these things as like independent cycling um, amplitudes here. So we see a daily drift in the circadian propensity for sleep in reference to the external day, and the magnitude of this drift, how big this is going to occur each day, is dependent on circadian tau. This is typically something we think about people who are totally blind because they lack the avail availability of light, which is what entrains the endogenous circadian rhythm, which is longer than 24 hours typically, back to the 24-hour day. When we see this in sighted individuals, we think about other reasons. For example, the circadian period, the endogenous circadian period, is so long that it's unable to entrain to the 24-hour day and free runs in this pattern, or there's another problem with entrainment. If the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells and the retinohypothalamic tract are intact, even those with visual blindness can entrain to the light therapy because they're still getting transmission of light information to the central clock. So when we look at this individual here, what we can see from this plot of sleep-wake time with time double, whoops, time double plotted horizontally here and days here, we can see that once this patient has whatever stimuli this is, they become entrained to a 24-hour day. And so this is likely low-dose melatonin and 10,000 lux light. Again, we don't know anything about this patient's visual status, but we can see from the graph that these two Zeitgebers are indeed entraining him. And when he stops, he free runs again. Okay, so I think we have a little bit of time left to fly the friendly skies. So I don't know who is listening to this right now, but those of you who know me know that my husband is originally from Hawaii, and we go there every year, and we go for a long time. We go for two weeks, and when we come back, my kids never listen to my in-flight recommendations. As you can see here, I'm wearing sunglasses appropriately. Everyone's rolling their eyes at me, but when we get home, there's my little guy at after midnight who is still entrained to Hawaii time, which is in the evening. And so this is a, a picture says a thousand words. This is what happens to jet lag disorder is that we can traverse time zones more quickly than our endogenous circadian phase can adjust. And just because the clocks on the wall change doesn't mean our circadian phase changes. And so we're still set to our location of origin when we desire to be set to the time at our destination. Jet lag disorder requires travel at least across two time zones. And remember, this is transmeridian travel. And in addition to insomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness, there's also other functional impairments during the day, such as cognitive issues, general malaise, or somatic symptoms like GI disturbances, which are the most common. And we'll do a case to depict this. Dr. Smith is a 48-year-old sleep physician with no past medical history. He's going on a 14-day trip to London during British summertime, which is Eastern Standard Time plus five hours, and departing from Detroit, which is Eastern Standard Time. He typically sleeps well at home from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. However, the last time he was in Europe, he was upset because he couldn't fall asleep at those times there, and he slept in, in the morning, tragically missing breakfast. He arrives at Heathrow Airport at 11.15 a.m. What should you recommend to Dr. Smith after arriving in London to reduce his symptoms of jet lag? I'll let you guys look at these and think of what your answer is. I'll give you a minute. Okay, so no matter how long I've been doing this with jet lag, I always draw things out. Okay, so we have Detroit Eastern Standard Time here up top and then London time on the bottom. And you can see this is five hours later than the clock time in Detroit. When an individual immediately arrives in a new location, keep in mind that their circadian phase is set to where they came from. So this individual was sleeping 11 to 7 habitually. This was his natural sleep-wake time. 
So that gives him an estimated core body temperature minimum as 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but 10 a.m. London British Standard Time. Additionally, his dim light melatonin onset, which we said is roughly two hours prior to habitual sleep onset, is gonna be around 9 p.m. Detroit time, but 2 a.m. London time. So if he wants to go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 7 a.m. in London, his endogenous circadian phase will have to undergo a phase advance so that his high propensity for sleep here aligns with his desired sleep wake time. How do we do that? With getting lots of light after the core body temperature minimum, so lots of light after 10 a.m., avoiding light prior to 10 a.m., and if he takes melatonin at 11 p.m. London time, that will be a few hours prior to his estimated dim light melatonin onset, and so will produce a nice phase advance. Additionally, melatonin will likely have a direct hypnotic effect at this time since he's not making it. So the answer would be B, seek bright light upon arrival, given that the arrival time was 11.15 a.m., so after 10 a.m. British summer time, which aligns with the patient's core body temperature minimum, which is set to 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and take melatonin 3 milligrams at the desired bedtime. So some jet lag principles. Generally, eastward travel requires a phase advance to align with local time, and westward travel requires an endogenous phase delay to align with your destination time. However, if you're going eight or more time zones, because of when light is likely to be available in reference to the core body temperature minimum, a delay is recommended because of how your central clock will interpret the light, which is always going to be in a phase delay direction, and we call this antidromic shifting. It's easier to travel west. Why is that? Because the circadian tau is typically more than 24 hours, it's easier for our endogenous circadian phase to delay in reference to external time as opposed to advance. Additionally, if you're on vacation, it might be behavioral e behaviorally easier to push your sleep times later than it is to, to bring them earlier. So alignment with the new time zone will happen naturally in jet lag, about 90 minutes in the delay direction with Western travel, 60 minutes in the advanced direction with Eastern travel, but because sometimes people have to perform with a high level, for example, business, um, athletics, treatment sometimes is needed to accelerate the shift and decrease symptoms. And the more the time zones you cross, obviously, the longer it takes to adjust. You're going to get roughly a day per time zone of a, to adjust to the new time zone. If you're traveling less than two days, it's recommended you stay at home time. Case six. This is our last case. A 56-year-old male with severe obstructive sleep apnea presents to your clinic for follow-up. At last visit, he had no problems falling asleep or staying asleep on auto titrating CPAP of 11 to 15 centimeters of water. He reported excellent daytime alertness, and he has scheduled this urgent appointment with you for excessive sleepiness and sleep fragmentation. Prior to going into the room, the nurse hands you the following CPAP download. Okay. Patient is on APAP. Our pressure range looks good. Probably could liberate that maximum pressure somewhat based on this. Leak is fine. And he's using the device every single day with a median of more than eight and a half hours of use. But you flip the page and you see this. Now, CPAP use is not a direct measurement of sleep, but it can sometimes give us some interesting ideas of sleep-wake patterns. And what we can see here is when CPAP is being used during the nighttime hours, usage is continuous. And then when it's being used during daytime hours, it is highly fragmented. So this could be suggestive of shift work disorder, which is defined as insomnia and or sleepiness in the context of sleep deprivation when the work period overlaps with when an individual usually sleeps has to be present for three months. And indeed, this patient had started night shift work between his last visit and his current. 
So which of the following interventions has been shown to maximize both circadian alignment and alertness with night shift work? I'll let you guys take a look at those answers. So let's think about what happens in somebody who's starting night shift work and who sleeps well from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. and reverts to the sleep-wake pattern on their days off. Their core body temperature minimum is going to be aligned to night sleep and day alertness. So here around 5 a.m. and dim light melatonin onset is going to be around 9 p.m. if this is somebody who falls asleep easily at 11 p.m. And say this is somebody in the healthcare field, this is a problem because during that night shift, their nadir of alertness is in line with when they're at work taking care of patients. Now, these people will typically fall asleep easily in the morning when they go home because of why they have that high homeostatic sleep drive, but they can't maintain sleep at the latter half of the sleep period because their endogenous circadian phase is misaligned with their desired sleep-wake time. So to move the time of their high natural propensity for sleep into the desired sleep-wake time, a phase delay is recommended, and that can be achieved by light during the first portion of the shift, which is also directly alerting and avoidance of light in the very end of the shift on the way home, though you have to be very careful about this in the circumstances of driving with sunglasses on. And this will produce a phase delay and has been shown to improve alertness in shift work disorder. Melatonin for daytime sleep can be helpful in increasing sleep, but it hasn't been shown to promote alertness during the night shift. So the answer for this would be C. Okay, and that's all I have for you guys today. Also, I wear my sunglasses at night when I'm using an LED backlit device, as you can see, but I can take any questions now. And I'll take a look here. Oh, there are no questions. Okay, so I think we're all done.